One of the desires that our elder board has here at this church is to train young men and the next generation to carry on the gospel and even to plant churches and and go to other countries and so forth. And so the Lord has blessed Southside Bible Church with the Salinas family, Mateo and Amber and their four wonderful kids. And you brought your mom with you here. Welcome. Um, They've been with us for about six years, and uh, they have been such a delight, a faithful uh, family to come and sit in the back and and pray with others and serve. And uh, so it is such a great opportunity to have you come up and minister and share the words uh, that are on your heart. And I know you poured hours and hours over this. So come on up, brother. And It's good to be with everyone today. Um, I need to start off by just saying thank you um, to the body here. Because, as you all know, um, about two months ago, our daughter was involved in an accident in which she was ran over, a one-year-old, you know, and uh, me and my wife, uh, we just, our household is so, so grateful for the love and the support, um, the text messages, the emails, the prayers, um, All we can look back and just say is, thank you, Jesus, that you would spare our daughter. Not only did he spare her, but she's okay. Um, Other than a little bit of scarring, you would never know that she got ran over. And that is just, um, we're just so grateful for the body and to Christ that he would rescue her and he would cause her to be okay. And so thank you so much to the body at Southside and to our friends and family. So um, this morning... It's a privilege to be with you. And the text from the scripture we'll be using is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44. And this morning, the theme of today's message is Jesus Christ and his immeasurable value through the parable of the hidden treasure. And so let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your holy word. We thank you, God, that you preserved it for us to have, that we may know you, that we may be corrected. God, thy word is truth, and you've made this word available to us, Lord God. And we're very grateful that we have this word. I pray today, Lord, that you would protect it from any error. I pray that you would protect it from coming out in a way which would cause anyone to have a skewed view of Jesus Christ this morning, God. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us this word and that many have given their lives that we may have it. And so, precious Father God, would you protect it this morning? We thank you, Lord God, for the things that you do. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and your spirit that you use to reveal him to us, God. Have your way this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44, which reads like this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I'll read it again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. You have to excuse me this morning. It was dark when I left and I forgot my glasses. So if I'm squinting out at you or the clock, you have to be gracious with me. And so um, God is gracious. See, this is Christ in this parable And he's speaking about the halfway point within the gospel of Matthew, which is 28 chapters, this being the 13th. And as we read through the gospels, 
we see Christ preaching and teaching to the people, his followers, and those whom he would bring correction to. There were some that had a false view of him. They hated him. They wanted to kill him. Nonetheless, he would still preach and teach. And one particular method Jesus used during teaching was called a parable. And in Matthew chapter 13, there's seven parables that Jesus uses. So what's a parable and why did Jesus use them? See, the word parable, according to this commentary that I have, comes from a combination of two words that combine to throw out and cast and come alongside. The idea is that of placing two things side by side for comparison. A parable uses something with which the learner is familiar with from everyday life, from farming, the marketplace, and fishing, and compares it with something that is unfamiliar. In this chapter, various realities about the kingdom of heaven. The student learns something about the unfamiliar by its similarity to the familiar. Praise God for parables. One of the greatest things Christ does for his people is that he brings an understanding of who he is through these parables concerning his kingdom. And on our end, we have to come to an understanding that we have limits in our understanding of who he is. The unfamiliar of his kingdom can resonate in our hearts, especially when we first come to the faith. And we need his word and his spirit to open our minds to this truth that he shares as we look at Matthew 13. See, Christ knows this, and this is why he would use parables to help us out. He would have to use familiar things to help explain the unfamiliar for his audience because they needed to know his message or be accountable to it. He's not a cruel God that expects his people to try and figure out his kingdom but a loving Father who teaches believers through His Holy Spirit using His Word. And these parables are true-to-life stories that illustrate or illustrate a truth. And Jesus knew how to target His particular audience, just like He knows how to target our hearts. In Matthew 13, Jesus was addressing large crowds from a boat. And this crowd was Jesus' own people, that had a specific view of the kingdom of God. And these views would be challenged by Christ's parables that they would not understand. Their view of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his kingdom would be put into proper perspective or for some still remain a mystery. And the impact of the parable would be different depending on the person hearing the parables. Praise God for his grace. If you are here and you're a believer, the only reason why you're able to understand God's word is because he's given you understanding. It's hard as a believer when you share the truth and you have to wait on the spirit because you know what's at stake for those who hear the gospel. And you know that your job is to just preach and share the gospel. And I wish there was something that we could do to speed along the process, but God, in his timing, does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants, to whoever he wants. And for us who are being saved, it creates a humility that causes us to be grateful that he has brought understanding to his word. So there's always a reason why Christ does what he does, especially in the Gospels. And two reasons we know why Christ used parables to teach the large crowds. And later on, the disciples, as we get into the parable we are discussing this morning, is number one, the disciples, by explaining his parables, this is what a commentary says, by explaining his parables to his disciples, Jesus opened up the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. 
It has a logic all on its own, which human reason cannot penetrate. Its truth must be revealed. To be a disciple is to be in the school of revelation. That ability is given to disciples rather than being a result of human cleverness. Other mysteries of the kingdom include the mystery of the church that Paul speaks about in Colossians 1.26 and helping us understand the difference between the lion and the lamb. These are parables that Christ would use to speak to his people. And in order to understand Christ's parables, God would literally have to be able to grant you the understanding according to Matthew 13, verse 11. To the disciples, Christ would say in verses 16 and 17, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Can you think about that? I guess it would kind of be like us longing to see our Savior come back. But for the prophets and those in the hall of faith and Hebrews wanting to see how this worked, they knew something was coming, but they couldn't comprehend. And yet to the disciples, they actually got to see and hear and understand. I love in 1 John when John says, that which we have seen, which we have touched with our own hands. They got to see and understand the teacher. And this would cause the disciples to be humble. They had to, knowing that they would understand only because of God being gracious enough to them to allow them to understand. Has that ever hit your heart? Why me, God? You're so gracious that I would be able to understand. And only because of you. I could imagine the conversations the disciples would have amongst themselves, whether they be by a fire or walking to wherever they were going, and just them being in awe and wonder of why God would be gracious to them. That had to be humiliating in a good way. The crowds, number two, For the majority hearing these parables, they would come away with a different understanding than the disciples. Unlike the disciples, they were not granted the ability to understand these truths. One commentator says, however, those who had consciously rejected the Messiah would receive only judgment, beginning with Jesus' withholding of insight by the use of parables." By them not being able to understand, they were fulfilling prophecy, and the eyes and ears of their hearts would not be able to understand these truths. If you're a parent this morning, you know that sometimes you need to have conversations that your kids can't understand. So we have something called a parent code in our house, because we know that once we even talk about something, we are committed to that, according to our kids. And so parents talk at the dinner table or on the car home, the ride home, and they're able to communicate amongst themselves without the kids being able to understand what's taking place. Because like I said, if you even bring up an idea, it's a done deal. Tears start rolling. You're like, we never said that. Yes, you did. And so parents have to use code. And in the same way, Christ speaking in parables was exactly what was going on. He was fulfilling the prophet from Psalm 78, verse number two. Matthew 13, 35 says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Praise God for parables. Now that we've determined that Christ taught in parables, and that we needed to be granted understanding to understand them, we must ask, how do parables affect believers today? And there's many benefits to these parables that Christ uses. They're foundational for our faith because they challenge 
us to see Christ in the proper lens. They impact us. They're foundational. They impact the body. I remember one time I, we got a hold of uh, MacArthur's series, me and my wife, um, of the parable of the prodigal son. And in MacArthur, he calls it the tale of two sons. And I remember I was at work and I was listening on my headphones and God started dealing with my heart to the point where I started crying in the middle of work around a bunch of men. And I'm right there working and I'm crying and I'm broken and people are passing me by and looking at me and I'm trying to hide my tears. And they just, they impact the body to the point where I went home and I told my wife, I said, you got to check this out. And so she got a hold of the messages. And then these next few days, as I would come home, we wouldn't even say hi to each other. The first thing we would do was look at each other and say, did you hear the message? And then all we would do was talk about it and we would be in awe. And then what we would do is try and pass it on because of the impact that it had in our own lives. And so the, it also, parables, they impact the world and it doesn't even, they don't even recognize that they're talking about Christ's words sometimes. How many times will you hear somebody say, the prodigal has returned? Or you'll hear, hear on the news, the Good Samaritan Award goes to so-and-so today because they set a standard of what the kingdom looks like. And to the believer, these parables, they become personal. You read them and the Spirit of God gives you understanding just like the disciples and you know you have a standard of what the kingdom of God looks like. How many times have you read a parable and asked yourself, am I a wheat or am I a tear? Did the seed Christ talks about in the parable of the sower land in the good soil in my life or did it land beside the road? Did it land on the rocky places in my heart or among the thorns? Have you ever walked away from reading God's word and say, am I wicked or am I righteous? Because these parables, they challenge us and believers have access to the mind of God as we read and as we study them. They're found in both the Old and the New Testaments. When I think of the most powerful parables that I've ever read, I think of 2 Samuel chapter 12, as Nathan confronts David because of his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. David's anger burned against the man in the parable that Nathan presents for him. And even says, this man deserves to die. And Nathan says, thou art the man. When you read the scripture, you get a lot of thou art the mans. That scripture points right to you. You pair that parable up with Psalm 51, and you realize why there's so much truth in the book of Hebrews when it says, for the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. These parables are life-changing for us and we must recognize the importance of them if we are to see Christ the way he wants us to see him. So what about the parable we read today? Jesus has moved from teaching the crowds to now being inside a house with his disciples. He interprets one of the parables he just talked about and then shares the parable of the hidden treasure with them, which is, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. So we ask the question, what is the point of this parable? There was a man in the field, and this man found a treasure in that field and hid it again. And the man valued the treasure to the point where he joyfully went and sold everything he had to purchase the field that that treasure was in. Wow. Everything. What spiritual truth is being expressed in this parable? There is a treasure, and that treasure has immeasurable value. And this treasure is Christ. 
And just like the man who found the treasure, God has made Christ available to us. And this is not just any ordinary treasure because it never loses value. It's the God that Adam walked around with in the garden before they sinned. And nothing compares to this treasure. His value and worth cannot be estimated. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to watch the stock market. He is God. It's a full and complete treasure, lacking nothing. Not only lacking nothing, but not needing anything from creation, yet still holding all of creation together. He existed before time even began, along with the Father and the Spirit. And this treasure is the head of our church, with full authority given to him by the Father. In the parable, we see the man from his joy, go and sell everything in order to be able to purchase the field containing this treasure. Despite the wisdom of the world, the man put all his eggs in one basket. He put all his chips in, and he went from having all of his options open to having one option. Foolishness in the world's eyes. And the amazing part of this is that in his joy, he did this. It was not a burden to him because none of his personal valuables could compare to the treasure which he was about to obtain. He had to have the treasure at any cost, and he was willing to do whatever it took to get that treasure. To answer this, the Christian knows the value of Jesus Christ. If you're to treasure the treasure the way it ought to be treasured, what would cause somebody to do this in all his joy? And it would have to be an understanding of who God is and who man is. You see, in order for us to be able to attain, obtain possession of salvation, we must first understand that in all of God's goodness, and his ability to be self-sufficient within the Godhead, he created man, and he had a relationship with him. And Adam had everything he needed to be satisfied in the garden until they sinned. And in God's holiness, him and man could no longer coexist until there was a sufficient atonement for his sin. And because of Adam and Eve, sin has been passed down to all men with the inability to be able to satisfy the justice needed to be made right with the sovereign God. We have become God's enemies. Our works can do nothing for us to be made right with him. We cannot meet God halfway in order to be made right with God. There was nothing that we can do to buy our way to be made right with God. Our good deeds cannot outweigh our bad deeds in order to be right. You can't say, I'm a good person, God. You can't do this to me. I mean well. We are helpless and hopeless because of Adam and Eve's sin. We cannot keep the demands of the law. We could work our hands to the bone, but nothing could atone. We are helpless and hopeless if we are to have any attempts based on our own merit to be made right with God. One sin separates us from God, and we are full of it. And we've been given over to our sinful nature that hates God being born dead in our trespasses. And all equally deserve justice and wrath because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Of God. Enter the God man into man's situation. For his namesake and because of his love, he offers his hand to the sinner by becoming the sacrifice needed for man to be made right with God. He sought out his enemy. Like the hymn says, man owed a debt 
He couldn't pay, and God could pay a debt he didn't owe. And that debt, the price paid for that debt would be his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin. Now, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. What a good God we have. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. This is the gospel. And when a person understands this, and they value this, They're like a man who finds a treasure in a field and bury it. And in joy, goes and sells everything they own to buy this field so they can obtain the treasure that Christ talks about. Christ is the treasure in this parable. If you've been saved this morning from your sin, You know how valuable this treasure is. You know that nothing compares to this treasure. That the value of it, you'd be willing, you'd be foolish not to give up anything for this treasure. That nothing in this world can compare or satisfy the way that this treasure does. May he be the treasure in our lives. A few things to discuss before we close. Number one, the treasure will always be about Christ. The focus of this great treasure will never change. As you get into the book of Revelation, you know there's only one that can open the scroll. And there's one that we sing to for all eternity. And it doesn't change. And we find as believers satisfaction in that treasure, being that it will always be Christ. And as believers, we must be careful. We must guard our hearts and our minds because there are some that say that they value this treasure, but they're only into things that cause them to be man-centered instead of God-centered. They want to be treasures themselves that is boasted on instead of Christ. They want to make the gospel about them and not our God. And they're more concerned about what they can receive from God than focusing on God himself. You see it shared sometimes with the way the gospel is presented. And they want to talk about the benefits of coming to the Lord and what he can do for you. But we must be careful that we never stop being in awe of who he is. I praise God for the things that God does for us. I thank God for his joy and his peace and those things that the Spirit gives us because of our faith. But those things cannot replace Jesus Christ. He's got to be the treasure in our hearts. See, nothing can satisfy but Christ alone. And we see that. We see that even in the book of John chapter 6 where people want to eat, but when it comes to eating his flesh and drinking his blood, they say, who can receive this message? Who can accept it? The disciples could. Where will we go? See, there's blessings that come from our relationship, but the biggest blessing is we get to see Christ. And we also get to see how Christ is loved by the Father and by the Spirit and their beautiful relationship within the Godhead. 
What a blessing that is. And for all eternity, we will be there worshiping our king, watching the relationship between the three. What keeps a person suffering for the sake of the gospel? Is they value Christ as he should be. He is their treasure. What could cause a man to give his life or a woman? What could cause someone to sit in prison for the sake of the gospel? What would cause these great men that we read about in the gospels and throughout the book of Acts to suffer the way they suffered? Is they valued Christ and they knew that value would not change. He will be the value of all our eternal focus. Praise God. The second thing that we must understand about this treasure that we have is that the world does not treasure our Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, there's a different view than those who remain the enemies of God and those who are believers in the gospel when it comes to us valuing our treasure. To them, what we value is silly and foolish. I've been told that the gospel is true lies. The world, remember, is dead in its trespasses, therefore having different values. And it will never see our treasure the way it ought to be seen, unless, like the parables, God opens up their heart. You know, as a parent, I fight with my kids when they get money. Because for their birthdays, they get gift cards, they get money. And, of course, what do they want to do? They want to go spend the gift cards. And in their world, when they show up to the toy aisle, they hold a certain toy at extreme value. Meanwhile, for me, I know what's going to happen as soon as we get home. I know I'm going to step on it. I know that we're going to break it. I know that they're going to value it just for a little bit. So in my mind, I'm saying, uh, why don't you just save your money to buy something that you really, really want? And when I tell them that, they say, this is what I really, really want. And I know that that's not what they really, really want. And so we fight, and my wife looks at me, and she's like, talking that parent language, the code I was talking about earlier, and she says, just let them get it. It's their money. They'll learn. So I say, okay. And in the same way, just as my kids value certain things, and I don't see that value, we value Christ, and the world does not value him whatsoever. They want his morality, but they do not want him. You think about what we value. You know, our message is foolish to them. We believe that the Bible is God's word being the only truth and having full authority over our lives. We believe in Christ coming through the virgin birth. Foolishness to them. We believed in Christ becoming God or coming as God as a man. He was already God, but he clothed himself in humanity. We believe that Christ was perfect and he didn't sin. We believe that Christ literally died on a cross and that he was raised from the dead never to die again, proving that he was God. We believe Christ will return for his people. We believe that a loving God can and will send sinners to hell. We believe that all men are born in sin and that a sinful nature already exists in them. That's hard for some people to, when they see and they value the goodness of humanity and you tell them that you're born sinner, that's foolish to them. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God and that according to Christ and what he says, therefore, not all paths lead to God. We're not all going to end up in the same place because of our different faiths. It is Christ and it is Christ alone. And this 
is what the unbeliever mocks and ridicules us because they say the Bible is fables. And they ask us where our invisible God is. But we know the truth and we can't become discouraged as we walk in this world and as we live amongst them. Because at one time we were there with them. And there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confessed. But on our end, because we are believers, we need to do whatever we can to get the gospel to them. God's wrath is real and it is coming. And although they mock right now and they don't understand God's common grace, we know that wrath is coming. And so for us as believers, we must do everything in our power to be obedient to the command of Christ to preach the gospel, as Brother Thomas talked about two weeks ago. Knowing that we are just being obedient and that we don't have the power to raise anyone from the dead. It must be Christ. As believers, we cannot get discouraged at the lack that the world has for our God of value, especially when we know where we come from. And the numbers are not even close. Sunday morning should be the most traffic-packed day of the week as everybody comes to church. And yet, when you drive on a Sunday, it's open roads. The world does not value this kingdom, and it's God. And remember the crowds that Christ was speaking about in our text this morning, is that there was crowds that he had to speak off a boat, and then there were his disciples. Many more in the crowds than the disciples who understood. And we must remember that our power solely lies and what God wants to do. The Spirit lives within us, and we're commanded to preach the gospel to all men. I love what Al Mohler says. He says, it is our job to get the gospel to their ears, and God will take it from their ears to their hearts. We leave it up to God. And we must remember the depravity of men. And we must also remember that God can save anyone. And we are living testimonies of his saving power. It's amazing how foolish the world deems us to be and at the same time what the world is willing to invest into their value and their treasure. Things that are actively, as they watch, fade away. Only a man in his total depravity could create and shape an idol that he created and then worship it as if it's God. Only a person lost in darkness could believe that something came from nothing. For us, our heart must break for these individuals. Our heart must cry because they have the opportunity to share within this treasure. This isn't a treasure that we keep to ourselves. This is a treasure that we want all to come to the banquet and experience with us. The third thing, is you will only continue to value this treasure with the help of God. We are so dependent as followers of Christ on him to help us value Christ. Because just like Peter, as we get out of the boat and we start walking to him, sometimes we take our eyes off the prize and we start to sink. And it can become discouraging as a believer when we look at him and we don't give him what we feel like he deserves. How many times have you been in prayer only to be saying things with your mouth, but having your heart and your mind in a different place? We need Christ to keep this treasure in front of us. This isn't something that we serve God on our own sheer willpower. This is something where the believer comes to Christ and he has his heavenly father, and that heavenly father becomes our father, and he stays our father. It's not like when we're young, how our parents prep us to go into the real world, and then they release us. This is something that requires the believer to be in tune with his heavenly father forever, and that's the best place to be. There are times when we don't want to endure 
hardships like a true soldier in Jesus Christ. There are times where we will see things that will attempt to take our focus off. How do we know this? Watch the news. Watch a debate. Talk to somebody who has a different view of you than you. And all of a sudden, your treasure sometimes becomes other things. We are challenged in the world that we live in to constantly look other places. And that is why the Spirit of God must be our source to help us keep our eyes on the cross. And we need God's Spirit. In 2 Timothy 1.14 says, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. We are so dependent on this Spirit of God. He is working in us and through us and taking care of us even when we don't recognize it. Because as believers, He dwells within us. And as you know, our world is a little different today than it was a year ago. And I remember as we first went into our shutdown back in March, me and my wife, uh, we went to the store. And my view of this treasure changed real quick. Two weeks prior, at the beginning of March, I was sitting with a group of young men. And I was sharing with them the Lord's Prayer. And I came to the, the point where it says, and give us this day our daily bread. And I told them, we have to trust God for everything. And that looks a little different for us today because we can just go to King Supers when we're hungry and get whatever we want. And I remember talking to these young men. Two weeks later, me and my wife go to the store, and there is nothing on the shelves except for things that nobody wants to eat. And I know beggars can't be choosers. If I got to put some beets down, I'll put them down. But that's not something I desire. Even the beans and rice were gone. And that's something our family values. We went to the store, and for the first time in a long time when it came to that part of the Lord's Prayer, I had to put my money where my mouth is and say, God, we need you to provide for us. And as you can tell, I haven't missed a meal. As a matter of fact, we've had an abundance you see, my fear was not so much that I was not going to eat. My fear was that my kids would have nothing to eat. And we didn't know what truth is when it comes to this pandemic. All we knew is that we had a treasure that we had to keep our eyes on. And what God did for me was he used creation. I was able to work from my back patio, and because it was springtime, the ground was really wet. And as I was sitting in my backyard all day working, I noticed that the birds of the field of the air would come and they would feast in our backyard. And they had everything that they needed. They were pleasantly plump. I'm telling you, they would pull, I don't even know, me and my wife would be in amazement because they would just go someplace and just pull birds or worms. And there was multiple. And it showed me that God will take care of me because I need to focus on him being my treasure. There's times of panic. In the world that we live in today, People are rapidly moving towards darkness and wickedness in ways that the believer doesn't understand. And it's discouraging. It's disheartening. When you see some of the things on our ballots, what can be voted for, and how babies can be deemed not babies, and you can say, how could somebody view a child like that? We must understand that the depravity of man is wicked and foul. And as we talk to individuals like this, their only hope is Christ. Only what we can see if we could just give it to them. We can't get caught up in the things of this world. It's very important, but we also recognize how easy it is. May we trust the Spirit of God inside of us to keep Him our treasure and keep us focused on the prize. In this message, as God was dealing with me, and as we get ready to close, as I was letting God deal with my heart this week, I realized that I may say that Christ is my treasure, but my heart may be far from it. 
And I have to search my heart daily and trust that God will keep him in front of me. See, we all sit here this morning and we look at this treasure, but maybe there's some who don't value the treasure, but maybe you think you do. And that is an honest question that every believer must ask its own heart. God, help me to value this treasure more than anything in this world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much, God, for this treasure. What an amazing treasure it is. We need you, God, more than we know or understand to help us see the beauty of this treasure. God, this treasure is is so, so special to you to the point where your son came and you said, this is my son who I am well pleased. And you had affections for your son, God. And we need to have those same affections for him as you, God. Would you cause your spirit to cause us to value him more than anything or anyone in this world? We are so deep on the spirit of God to help us treasure this Christ We thank you for this cross, and we know, we know, we know that this treasure is attainable solely through what he has done for us, and not on our own. We thank you, Father God, for being our God today. In Jesus' name.